Good afternoon. My name is Yolanda Zapeta, and on behalf of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, I welcome you to Empowering Latinx Students for College Success. This is the first event in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion Hispanic Heritage Series. We begin our program this afternoon with a message about the Office of Diversity and Inclusion 50th Anniversary. Diversity celebrates its sesquicentennial. The Office of Diversity and Inclusion has a special anniversary of our own, our 50th birthday. From our tumultuous beginnings in 1970 until today, our office has stood proudly as a fierce advocate for historically underrepresented students, faculty, and staff. The world has changed over the past half century, but we have never wavered from our bedrock belief that greater inclusion has merit and diversity brings us strength. It is important to us to honor the giants of diversity whose shoulders we stand on today. That's why in early 2021, we will induct the first 50 icons of inclusion into our inaugural Office of Diversity and Inclusion Hall of Fame. As we turn 50, we vow that our best days are ahead of us. We have ambitious plans to expand our capacities by tirelessly building onto the foundation of our first half century, removing barriers every day. We all benefit when diversity and inclusion is woven through our daily work. And to succeed, we must all pull together. We look forward to your continued commitment as we push onward to the next horizon. Thank you for that. I would now like to introduce our, um, our panel moderator, Dr. Frederick Luis Aldama. Dr. Aldama is Distinguished University Professor at The Ohio State University. He is award-winning author, co-author, and editor of 48 books. His scholarship focuses on Latinx pop culture, including comics and children's literature. He recently published his first kid's book, The Adventures of Chupacabra Charlie. He is also faculty fellow in our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, where he founded and directs Latinx Space for en Enrichment and Research, or LASER. LASER aims to provide resources, access, mentorship, and guidance to Latinx students from high school through college, all with the goal of making college a tangible and positive experience for the Latinx community and other historically underrepresented groups. LASER serves local communities of color throughout the city of Columbus by creating opportunities for our youth of color to engage with their peers to connect with role models in our community and to become leaders themselves through mentorship. Thank you, Professor Aldama, for joining us today and leading this discussion, moderating this discussion. I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Yolanda, for that introduction. And it is uh, my great honor to be here with Luis and Desiree. Thank you both for joining us today. I'm going to share just a little bit about kind of why, um, yeah, why I suppose I'm in this space with these luminaries, these uh, sort of kind of path breakers, pioneers in the field of uh, bringing kind of attention, the spotlight onto our Latinx, our very diverse Latinx communities and the lack of access, right? Um, but yeah, so uh, I joined OSU about 15 years ago and in the first year after visiting friends of family in the west part of Columbus and going to visit their schools um, with them and so on, I realized that there was a real kind of disconnect between OSU, this very prominent, very uh, wealthy kind of university, and the communities, the Latinx communities here in Columbus that were the fastest growing communities actually in the city. And teachers telling the students that college isn't for them, OSU certainly isn't for them, um, that they should be thinking about, you know, at best community college. But really the, the main narrative was, you know, work for your dad um, or, you know, um, maybe the the uh, Eddie Bauer factory, the Pfizer factory, those are kind of good, good spaces for you. And I wanted to change that narrative and ODI um, became the place for me uh, for, for that change to happen. And as faculty fellow at ODI, um, you know, 
bringing the idea and then bringing it to fruition where laser the latinx space for enrichment research now we're almost well yeah, i guess we hit our 10th year um hubs all over the city in high schools and all the kids either having the choice to come to osu that are in these hubs in the high schools that are latinx but not exclusively latinx we have um Somali and African American kids in the program as well, and really kind of bringing those pathways and that access and showing them that OSU can be a place for them. And two of the things that really became significant for LASER, in addition to my the undergraduate and graduate students that are in those hubs all over the city, is um, was Solcon, the Black, Brown, and Indigenous Comics Expo that happens every fall. This is our fifth year. And really the idea behind that was in a true comics to bring our communities of color together. Because one thing I also noticed in Columbus is that we don't have cultural festivals on the books that allow our communities to come together and share um, commonalities and stories, but also affirm and acknowledge and be empowered in differences. And so SOLCOM became that space, like K through 12 space, a space for teachers, a space for our students on campus to engage also with the community um, and with comic books. And that's in the fall. And then in the spring, I've uh, launched also a very successful Latinx Role Models Day. And we bus in around 500 or so Latinx um, high school kids and it's a full day on campus and they get to meet students and mentors and um, learn about the, the campus. Most importantly, it's a day where they feel like this is a place for them. And of course, we want it to be more than a day. And that program's also been very successful at changing the narrative and changing how our students, future generations of our students from our communities really can see themselves at a place like OSU. I just wanna mention that all of this is possible at a place like OSU because of um, the tremendous efforts of people like Yolanda Zepeda and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion where you know, when I arrived in 05, um, we were, gosh, so few, uh, maybe two, two, maybe three percent kind of, you know, as we moved up into the, you know, 2010s. Today, we're around five, six percent Latinx. I know it's not the kinds of numbers that we want to see if we're looking at the national picture. The national picture is, you know, very different, of course, 18, 19 percent. But if you think about where we were and where we are today, it is pretty remarkable. And a lot of this is through ODI's programs and real um, absolute support for Latinx students, Latinx, the Latinx Leadership Development Program. Also, our Moral Scholars Program has been really important for our laser kids for Latinx uh, students in general to be able to afford coming to OSU because it's one thing to get in and then it's another thing to be able to afford to come. Um, on that same note, we ODI has been really great about once you are here, making sure that our students of color are also put on the radar as those who um, not only deserve but should be on those international programs abroad that we have, like Brazil and the Dominican Republic and um, other places where we have like Panama. Um, you know, right, Luis and Desiree, like that's another part that's so important. You know, somehow it's like, oh, well, you're Latinx, so you don't, why would you want to go to Mexico or the Dominican or, right? And you're like, well, um, you're white, why would you wanna read Shakespeare? You know, you know, it's like, okay, this is the most ridiculous question we've ever heard. The other thing that I love um, about ODI is um, the, this wonderful publication, Que Pasa, that Yolanda has been leading the lead on as support and kind of overseeing. Um, it's edited by a graduate student. Um, typically it's been in English or women's gender sexuality studies, history, 
um, sometimes even helmed by two graduate students. And I bring it up because it showcases our high school students that are involved, um, our community members that are involved in shifting and radically changing the narrative and really celebrating our undergraduates and graduate students as well as faculty and staff on our campus that are making all, that do all the work to, to not just make this a moment, but to really have created a movement that has really enriched and transformed the culture in and around higher learning for Latinx students. So I, I'm not here to keep talking about laser. Um, I'm here to facilitate uh, this wonderful discussion with our featured panelists. Um, I cannot wait to hear about your journeys and how you've brought, you're bringing your scholarship that's informed from your journeys and the journeys as they unfold today. Dr. Desiree Vega is um, Associate Professor the School of Psychology at the University of Arizona. She received her BA in psychology from Binghamton University, State University, New York, SUNY, and an MA and PhD in 2011 from the School of Psychology from our very own OSU. Yay, <laughs> so awesome. Um, where, in fact, Dr. James Moore served on her dissertation committee. Before becoming a renowned professor, Dr. Vega worked as a bilingual school psychologist at Omaha Public Schools from 2010 to 2013. Author of numerous groundbreaking research articles, Dr. Vega is the leader in bringing a social justice lens to advocate for the needs of culturally and linguistically diverse CLD students. Welcome, Desiree Dr. Vega. Next is Dr. Luis Ponjuan, Associate Professor, Educational Administration and Human Resource Development and Resource Director of IDEAL, that stands for Investing in Diversity, Equity, Access, and Learning, at Texas A&M. This is Yolanda Zepeda's alma mater. Dr. Ponjuan brings a social justice research approach to issues that face Latino male access to college, as well as faculty members of color and STEM learning outcomes generally. He is co-editor of the groundbreaking, ensuring the success of Latino males in higher education, a national imperative, and I am so, so happy to welcome both of our featured guests. Welcome. I'm gonna launch with, um, as we get into this, um, you know, the first question for Desiree really, I'm gonna ask what, what inspired you to become a creator, educator, activist? Why don't we begin with you, Desiree? So just for, yeah, for clarification, Yolanda, we can't hear you. <laughs> yes, sorry, um, Professor Aldama, if we could um, hear from, our, give, give our panelists a chance to um, oh. present some of their research and, and then we can. I'm sorry, them. yes, I was so excited. <laughs> I jumped us like all the way to the end of the program. Desiree, please, um, we would love to hear from you, yes. Yes, yeah, so that, that was what I was going to ask. Um, let me see if I can share the screen. Is that um, good? Okay. So one, thank you so much for this invitation, you know, to be here today. Um, sad that we couldn't be here in person. I really love going back to Ohio and, you know, visiting my alma mater and all my family and friends that, you know, I, um, you know, met during my, during my few years there. Um, and so when Yolanda reached out via email to, you know, send the invitation about the panel, 
again, I was really excited to have this opportunity to give back to the OSU community. Um, so I got so much from my experience in the five years that I was there. Um, and then I was also excited to see that um, Dr. Pong Juan was on the panel too, um, just because of our shared um, Afro-Latinx identities, which are often not centered and left out when there are discussions um, about Latinx folks, right? And so, you know, I'm grateful to have this opportunity um, to, you know, share with you all today. And you can follow me on Twitter if you're on Twitter. I did also want to take a moment to, um, one, acknowledge and recognize Brianna Taylor's life. Um, it's been, you know, challenging year, week, decade, um, the decision, of course, is not a surprise. Um, we often don't get justice. Um, it's, of course, unfortunate and painful to have to continue to have these experiences, um, especially as Black and Brown communities that are disproportionately targeted and murdered by police. Um, and we all deserve so much better. So with that, I want to share a little bit about myself. Um, thank you to Dr. Aldama for sharing because we have some overlap in our time and I knew your name, but I never knew who you were during my time as a student at OSU. Um, I started in 2006 and then I left in 2010 for internships to go to Omaha. And so laser kind of happened um, when I left too. So. So I didn't have some of those experiences. Um, but again, you know, I'm, I identify as Afro-Latina. I was born and raised in New York and Brooklyn and Queens, um, Puerto Rican, New Yorican, uh, first generation college graduate, the first to go to college in my family, the first to graduate. Um, I did want to share a little story that I often tell to undergrad students um, who are trying to make decisions um, about you know majors and what to do in their future. When I started college, I intended on majoring in accounting and clearly that's not the path that I went on. Um, and I was enrolled in a microeconomics class my first semester. And we had our first exam, I got an F on the exam. And, you know, I'm in crisis at that time, you know, 17, 18 years old in college, like, what am I going to do? I had this plan. Um, am I going to fail out of college? Am I not going to be successful, right? And all this pressure as a first gen student also. Um, thankfully, I was able to drop the course prior to the drop deadline. So that was kind of the one um, saving grace out of this and, you know, blessings that came along with also taking an intro to psychology class at the same time. And that class was not the most exciting and not the best. It was in the largest lecture hall on campus with over 400 students. And so when we think about like student learning and engagement, that's of course not ideal, right? But I did take another psych class the next semester. And there were, I remember there were graduate students that came in to talk about this clinic that was on campus for kids who had learning disabilities as well as um, developmental disabilities, right? And opportunities for psychology majors. To, um, to work there and also complete a certificate that was part of the program. And so I started doing that in my sophomore year and it really exposed me to what one could do as a psychologist. And then it also exposed me to graduate school because you really can't do anything in psychology with a bachelor's in psychology. So I was like, oh, like what is this grad school thing, right? And like now I have to figure out what I'm gonna do next, right? And with that too, like learning about the McNair Scholar Program that was on my campus at Binghamton and becoming part of the program, which is designed for um, students from underrepresented backgrounds to um, expose them to graduate school and those who have an interest in pursuing a PhD. Um, we had a strong director and she was really instrumental, Karima Leggett in, um, you know, just helping me understand like, what it meant to go to graduate school, apply to graduate school, what to look for in programs, you know, kind of the nitty gritty that um, you don't have in terms of capital as a first gen student, right? And so that ultimately led me to Ohio State. Um, the Ohio State program in school psychology has a strong social justice focus. So um, shout out to Dr. Antoinette Miranda, and Dr. Keisha Radliff, um, Laurice Joseph, who are all 
my professors during my time there. And that really had a strong um, impact on the work that I do today and setting up my trajectory um, in terms of blending, you know, the personal and professional, right? Like the work that we do is very much inspired by our own life experiences and wanting to give back to our communities and for our communities to have opportunities. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that when we get into um, the moderated questions. So I did wanna take a little bit of time to talk about some of the research that I've done and I'll try not to take up um, too much. So feel free to cut me off if we're at you know 20 minutes because um, I know some of the stuff we'll talk about within um, the question and answer. So some of the primary areas that I have been focused on is looking at enrollment and persistent decisions among Latinx first-gen college students. So why are students going to college or what factors have supported their college-going behaviors and what factors have supported um, continuing in college, right, through graduation. So that retention piece, not just getting into college. And like um, Frederick said, like college can be expensive and students getting there is not enough, right? We want students to leave with a degree as well. And then looking at how school psychologists and school counselors can collaborate to support college going among minoritized students. And I focus primarily on African-American or black students and um, Latinx students as well. And then, you know, kind of more central to the work that I do and within the classroom primarily, right? Um, is how do we prepare culturally competent school psychologists, right? The field is very white and they have little contact with folks who are different, right? And so they lack knowledge and skills to work with populations that differ from their own identities, right? And when we look at outcomes and data, we see that there are dismal outcomes for our minoritized students. And so we, you know, for me as a educator and as a trainer, I have an obligation to make sure that my students get high quality training in working with diverse populations. And that goes along too with bilingual school psychologists because when we throw in the language piece as well and the acculturation piece, uh, those are additional challenges um, that are imposed on those students, not a function of their language or cultural background. So just a little bit about this study actually. So I used to work at Texas State prior to coming to the University of Arizona. So I was there for three years and lived in Austin. Um, and so I looked at high achieving um, first generation Latinx students. And so they have to have a GPA of 3.5 or above first in their family to go to college, identify as Latinx and you know, be enrolled in college at the time. And so I really wanted to challenge this notion because a lot of times people think, oh, like if you're a high achieving student, you have no challenges. And that is completely false, um, that there are some obstacles that come up while also focusing on student strengths, right? And so, you know, some of the things that they shared with me and it was a qualitative study is, you know, having access to those advanced courses. And so taking AP courses, honors courses, um, were really, helpful in preparing them for the rigor of college um, and college level work. Support network, this is kind of widely demonstrated in the research, the importance of family, um, positive educators, as well as friends in helping students make decisions about college as well as staying in college. And then some of the persistence decisions and you know why students continue um, some students talk about like, well, I've made it this far. I'm gonna keep pushing along. It's important to get a degree for my future. Um, and some talked about that responsibility as being a first generation college student. So while it's empowering for them, um, they talked about how you know they can be a role model for their younger siblings or family members and friends who are coming up. Um, but then they also like simultaneously felt this pressure to succeed, um, which I can definitely relate to when I was having the crisis um, about what I was going to do with my future when accounting was no longer, um, you know, a viable option for me. And then again, you know, challenges, financial concerns, um, you know, not having scholarships and such to go to college or stay in college. Um, and then this was a critical piece too, in terms of 
they had some educator support and then there were students that talked about having a lack of guidance and also low expectations. And so there wasn't like a college going culture in their schools. Um, and their educators didn't see them as being college material, right? And so think about that message that that sends to um, students, right? And so thinking about, you know, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the things that I do, right? And I feel like they're little and kind of a grand scheme of things. But I think like as um, a black woman, as a Latina woman, and being very few on college campuses, showing up and letting students know like, oh, there are other people that look like you who are professors and you can be a professor as well. And I think, you know, for me in graduate school, having Dr. Miranda, having Dr. Radliff, having Dr. Moore, um, and also um, Dr. Lilia Fernandez, who was in the history department at the time, who was also on my dissertation committee. Um, she was also a great inspiration to see, right? And so just knowing that there are folks out there um, who support you and who want to see you do well and will help however they can, like I try to do that as much as possible. Um, we had a faculty fellows program, but the funding is on pause due to, you know, COVID and all the budgetary issues. So I was a fellow at the, it's called the Thrive Center on campus for the previous two years. And the center has a bunch of different programs. Um, and one of the programs is called First Cats, um, since we're Wildcats here at Arizona. Um, and for first generation college students and you know, some of the things that I engaged in with the students and a lot of the first gen students were from low income backgrounds and Latinx, right? And so things like mentoring, um, meeting one on one with students to give feedback on things like personal statements. I'm just talking through like applying to graduate school or applying for scholarships. And um, there's a lot of programming, of course, that goes on through the center. So I, you know, served on panel discussions. I remember one was you know, graduate school versus workforce, right? You know, again, like a bachelor's in psychology was not gonna get me far in the workforce. And so thinking about decision-making processes around, um, should I go to graduate school? Should I enter the workforce immediately? Um, or do I need a graduate degree at all? And then also workshops. Um, so in the past spring semester, right before COVID hit, I did a workshop for some students who are gonna be applying to graduate and professional school. And so we talked about things like personal statement, um, interviewing, making decisions about where you should go and those sorts of things. And so when I think about like what things faculty can do, I think these are pretty um, like small steps in the grand scheme of things and don't require too many resources. So also, so kind of back to the collaboration between school psychologists and school counselors, right? And so we think about students K-12 experiences that's largely gonna impact their you know, future outcomes, right? Whether they go to college or not, whether they stay in college or not. And so I'm trying to think about like, how do I bridge this gap between school psychology and higher ed? Because there's not a lot of work done in that area as far as helping students get to college and the transitional period to college. So what is the role of school psychologists? Um, and Luis probably has some of this data. Um, so, you know, you can see it here, but college enrollment rates are pretty dismal. Um, there has been some growth over the 18 year period that is highlighted here from, um, this is from the Condition for Education report that was released in May. Um, but we still see like um, relative to the overall student population that Latinx students are um, not enrolling at similar rates. And then we look at degree attainment as well. We see um, some pretty big gaps. And as the, um, you know, as you get higher in the degree, so bachelor's and higher, um, that gap widens even more. Um, so I have one more slide after this. <laughs> <laughs> so school psychologists tend to get siloed into these very narrow roles that focus on, um, you know, being gatekeepers for special education. It was an experience I had as a school psychologist when I worked in Omaha, um, despite having training in a wide variety of areas. And school counselors face similar challenges, too, in terms of being siloed into very narrow roles. 
And so thinking about, you know, some of the steps that can be taken, you know, in collaborating between school psychs and school counselors. Um, one, I think awareness, like administrators often don't know what we do beyond some of these limited um, areas that they are actually aware of. And so advocating for that role expansion so we can put our other skills to good use, particularly as it relates to college, building a college going culture and looking at things like data, right? So who is actually going to college in, in some of these schools, right? Who's not going to college? And then looking at, you know, what are the supports that are actually in place um, for our students? And what do students need at the intersection of their identities, right? And so what Latinx students may be distinct from what African-American students need and what undocumented students need in terms of going to college, right? And support for college. And so making sure that we are attending to their different identities and um, making sure we're targeting that in terms of make, in, um, addressing their unique needs. And then embedding college going culture within the school, which does help students have this sense of like, oh, I can go to college. This is actually an option for me and setting those goals. Um, other ways to increase college knowledge and so school psychologists and counselors working one-on-one um, -on -one with students, working in groups, holding workshops, um, you know, doing kind of all those kind of nitty gritty things of like, what does a college application even look like? What is a FAFSA? How do I apply for scholarships? Um, all that start to finish that I know is very challenging for me and my family um, without having that capital. And then also partnering with community resources, families who are often strong um, advocates for their kids, right? And universities may have resources. And so thinking about some of the things that um, Frederick named that OSU is doing to engage the community and bridge that gap between the community and OSU. So then lastly, um, in terms of preparing culturally competent school psychologists. Um, school psychology as a field has lagged in producing social justice research, especially relative to um, the field of counseling psychology. Um, and I will say that it's not completely due to a lack of research being done, um, but more so the gatekeeping that's done for a lot of our journals. Um, other issues include a demographic mismatch in our field, um, similar to teachers, you know, our field is predominantly white female um, and our students are not that demographic. Um, so not having, again, not having training, knowledge, awareness, anything um, can cause a lot of the problems that we are seeing and reproducing inequities we see in society. Um, training program issues, you know, sometimes it's just we're going to have one diversity course and then you never talk about how to work with students from, you know, diverse backgrounds ever again in the rest of your training program. Um, that, of course, is not best practice and ideally would be an integrated model where this content is infused throughout. So when we're talking about counseling, we're talking about intervention, we're talking about consultation. Uh, we are attending to these unique issues that um, represent our, our different populations. As we see this shift in faculty diversity in school psychology in particular, in particular it's still um, not large, um, but definitely larger than say, you know, when um, Dr. Miranda, who, um, you know, is kind of pioneer in our field in terms of black women, um, we are seeing an increase, thankfully, um, and able to advocate and push, you know, our na national association to prioritize social justice um, and the needs of different populations. And I think two current events um, are um, pushing, pushing the envelope forward in terms of having that accountability in, um, you know, how we train future school psychologists and what's needed. And I think too, you know, kind of the bottom line, these, again, these K-12 experiences impact future outcomes, our Latinx students, our Black students, our Indigenous students, immigrant students, undocumented students, refugee students, um, and training of school psychologists, um, you know, needing to understand value, right, value these different identities. 
and have the skills like this needs to be a priority in our field um, in order to really help our students succeed. Thank you. Amazing, thank you. Um, Dr. Pong Juan, would you like to share? You? Yes, thank you. First of all, um, I want to give a shout out to Desiree for an uh, incredible presentation because we, did we talk before today? No, I just want to point out to you, your presentation is a perfect setup for my presentation. I'm just letting you know, I, you could not have planned this any better. So <laughs> I want you to know how much I appreciate you for laying the groundwork and more importantly, for giving me the space to talk about what I consider the second half of this talk. So uh, Yolanda, uh, Luis Mitocayo, I just wanna thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. And when I tell you what we're about to talk about, you'll see how it really complements one another. So my hope is I'm gonna to try to talk very, very fast. And I'm gonna to try to talk very, very quickly about the things that I think are important in my conversation. As you see in my background, my virtual background, Project Mails, I'm the co-founder uh, with Dr. Victor Sines on this research called Project Mails. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the presentation. So I wanna be mindful of the time. And so I'm just gonna go straight into the presentation. And like I said, I'm gonna to try to be quick about this and hopefully give you a picture. So can everyone see that? Wonderful. Okay, so the, the title of this talk is the title of this session, and that is Empowering Latinx Students for College Success. And I am Luis Pon Juan. I'm an associate professor at Texas A&M University. Uh, and there's my Twitter handle, there's my email. Uh, by all means, please reach out to me and more importantly, tweet, because I have a very large Twitter following or whatever Twitter following, and a lot of folks like to know the things that I'm doing. Um, I, I share this with you because I think it's important to have a conversation about this topic in talking about what this means. Uh, I, like I said, uh, am a faculty member at a and but uh, I'm involved with AHI, which is the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education. And for the last four years, since this beginning of my fifth year, I'm in charge of the Latinx Student Success Summit. And in that, it's a, it's a one day uh, pre-conference workshop where I could bring in experts to talk about issues about this very topic. So this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I want to be remiss if I did not say thank you very, very much uh, to Yolanda for reaching out to me uh, from uh, a and all the way at a and uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the community for giving me the space to talk about this because when we start talking about this, I wanna make something fundamentally clear about why I do what I do. Uh, I, I say this a lot, so you, some people have heard me talk about this before, please forgive me, but the reality is as a faculty member, I really don't believe I do research. Uh, I do me search and I do research on students and faculty that look like me because I have a very privileged space and I feel like I have an obligation to talk about the work that I think informs our practice and informs our understanding of the communities that are marginalized throughout higher education history. That being said, I think it's important to get a little bit of a picture of who I am and where I came from and, and why am I doing this. Uh, and, and I'll share this with you because I think it's important for when you hear the things that we've done and, 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 and the reality is sometimes I get really sheepish, I get really nervous, a little nervioso, when people say things about me because I'm not accustomed to that. I'm not accustomed to being out there. So uh, I'm a Cuban immigrant. Uh, this is a picture of me, my sister and my brother and Martha and Luis. Uh, earlier this year, my father passed away tragically and I am trying to do my work in memory of him because both of them at the ages of 33 and 26 came to the United States with nothing, absolutely nothing with their three kids and um, somehow, some way, uh, I became a tenured faculty member at an uh, AAU institution. And so I really wanna spend time talking about that little space between me when I'm this chubby little kid with a crazy haircut to me now uh, as a tenured professor. But more importantly, in the work that I've done, again, this is me, I wasn't, I wasn't speaking English at the time. I was an ESL student. How, how did I end up from 
being a Cuban immigrant to getting invited to the White House and meeting uh, President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, how did that happen and what did that look like? And so I really want to try to provide some context on, on really the importance of education and why education matters. So this kind of gives you a sense of who I am and my story and why I do what I do. Uh, I want to point out to you because Martha and Luis are, like I said, a, a first generation uh, immigrants to come to the United States. Uh, they have very, very thick accents. Uh, I was talking to my mother earlier today and uh, between their three children, uh, we have eight college degrees. So we are a testament of the American dream. And more importantly, we were DACA before DACA existed. And so for me, DACA and issues around Latino immigration issues are very near and dear to me. I became a naturalized citizen when I was 12. And so I understand the challenges and the barriers that students face as they move into higher education, let alone into the American culture. So that being said, I, I, I think it's important as, as Desiree had mentioned a moment ago, uh, the reality that we're in spaces that uh, are highlighting the notions of what Black Lives Matter mean. And I wanna talk about, it's about equity, justice, honor, and respect. And I wanna make an observation as I take a look at the, at the stories that are about Breonna Taylor and Amari and, and George Floyd and the, the pictures and the uh, depiction of these individuals. I wanted to put this picture of her because this is a picture that demonstrates her accomplishment as a community college graduate. These are the images that we need to share because a lot of folks, uh, as I know Dr. Aldama, you probably talk about the idea of how media shapes our understanding of culture. And this is a critical element that I, I am not, I'm unapologetic about. So I just wanna make that point that there's a lot more work to be done. But if that wasn't enough, uh, we're talking about the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is straight from the Ohio State website. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we have adjusted to a new shared, and I would argue abnormal reality, but educating our students must continue. In other words, we have to continue doing this work. This is not something that gives us a pause that we can kind of take a break. We have a commitment to educating the communities that we serve. That being said, I, this is a, a picture of Ohio State's campus, and, and I put here, you are here, right? The fact is, we are everywhere. I think uh, Yolanda basically said that uh, we have people from all over the nation uh, participating. And, and I want to point out, even though we are working in different spaces, even though we're working in different spaces, we are still working together. And so let's not forget the fact that we may be uh, um, physically apart, but we have to be socially connected. And so this is really an important element that complicates what we talk about as we think about the students that we serve at the college level. Next, I really wanted to point out what I, I'm a statistician. I, 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 my, my specializations in statistics and uh, research methodology. So I took a, a little sneak peek into the demographics of the undergraduate population, the minority population. I don't even think this is undergraduate. I think this is all students. Um, and I really wanted to point out something that I think is important for us to take a look at. And you see all those small numbers, so you probably don't see those numbers, but here is the takeaway from this data that you have here. 5% of the Columbus campus student population identifies as Latinx, 5%. What that really means is 95% of these students may not understand the challenges Latinx students face to attend Ohio State. That's the true narrative around what I talk about. And when we take a look at the faculty, uh, I really want to point out uh, uh, the Latinx faculty because they are some near and dear friends of mine that work at Ohio State. Uh, and Marie Nunez is a near and dear friend of mine. Uh, I've known her for, gosh, since we were both in grad school. Um, there's only 121, 121 tenure track faculty. What's interesting is they don't break it down by full assistant and associate. They just did the broad 121. There's 121 Latinx identified faculty. There's 3,025 Latinx students, graduate and undergraduate, I'm assuming. When you start thinking about what that means and what that represents, less than 5% are of the students and roughly 4% of the faculty are Latinx. And when we have these conversations about what does it look like to be on a campus that's a predominantly white institution, 
I don't want you to focus on the 5%. I want you to focus on the 95. There's 95% of the students, 95% of the faculty and staff that may not understand the challenges that Latinx students face to attend Ohio State. That to me is the compelling narrative that we want. We could argue about, uh, we need increased diversity, we need increased enrollment, but at the end of the day, that means nothing if the 95% do not understand what it means to be in those spaces. And so that being said, we must understand how diversity, inclusion, and equity ideals relate to Latinx students at The Ohio State University. And so for the folks who are on the, uh, on the webinar, I, I'm gonna go kind of like a quick tutorial in terms of how we have these discussions around Latinx students as it relates to diversity, inclusion, and, in, and equity. So if you permit me, I'm gonna briefly go over this quickly. When we have conversations about diversity, what it means by Latinx students, we need to start redefining the term for diversity for Latinx students. Dr. Vega, you made it abundantly clear and so grateful for you to, to say that. Like I said, I, need, I, I, I did not pay you to say any of those things, but you said some things that are very powerful. The fact that when we think about Latinx, we think about this homogenous monolithic group, when in reality, when we really think about it, we must recognize that we all have our own unique individual, visible and invisible traits. And so I spend an entire semester talking about this notion. So really, what does this really mean when we talk about the Latinx community? Well, a lot of this reflects the communities that you see in front of you. What this really means is when we think about Latinx and we think of our people, we really just focus on the in individual visible traits. These visible traits could be height, weight, skin tone, on tone uh, phenotype, hygiene, clothing apparel. Uh, I remember uh, AOC uh, was given a lot of heat for wearing hoop earrings. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, those visible traits make commentaries about how they think about this. Language accent, my father and my mother have very, very thick accents. And as I was growing up, I, I felt embarrassed, but now I, I embrace that. But for the people who are Latinx and for Latino, and, and I'm very fortunate that I'm bilingual and I speak, raise your hand or show a hands of the people who are the family interpreters for their family, for the parents who did not know. Those are the, those are the stories that a lot of folks don't understand, but those are the visible traits. But here's the thing, folks. We also, we also have what I consider critical invisible traits, family or individual SES, immigrant or document status, language comp comprehension, religion, sexual orientation, veteran status, food and housing insecurities, first generation, only child, criminal records, formerly incarcerated. There, there are some folks in this room that are dealing with abusive, physical or emotional relationships and are suffering. There are folks who have to deal with implicit bias, prejudice. There are folks who have different values than everyone in the room simply because of their own um, fears and whatnot. All this is to share an important element as we think about Latinx in, in campus communities. We need to accept that we all have implicit bias about people who are different from us. Not just the Latinx community, but the 95%. They have implicit bias. And so I wanna put a lot, I wanna shine a light on that notion because in order for us to have conversations about how do we create Latinx student success, we have to acknowledge that implicit bias exists. To pretend that it's colorblind, like Bonilla Silva work is uh, powerful about the notion of colorblind racism and that I don't see your color, I just see you, really negates the visible and invisible traits of these communities that we say we espouse, we want them to succeed. Next, I really wanna talk about inclusion. And inclusion is a really important element because if diversity is the noun, inclusion is the verb. And so what do we mean by inclusion? I wanna shine a light on what this means. This means that when we focus on inclusion practices, we feel a sense of belonging. What does that actually mean? That means that a sense of belonging, the feeling that Latinx students feels psychologically connected and physically invested to the Ohio State University community. Take Ohio State University out of that equation and put X institution, and how do we encourage Latinx students to feel psychologically connected and physically invested? And that is complicated when we talk about COVID, but I'm gonna address that. But this notion of sense of belonging 
is a, a critical element for students to achieve success as we move forward. And then finally, the last piece, this notion of equity mindedness. At the end of the day, when we think about equity, it's really about just and fair inclusion. The Ohio State University should continue to create a campus climate and experience in which all students, faculty and administrators and staff, especially the Latinx population participate and prosper. And I really wanna highlight this piece here that's really kind of essential. Create a campus climate, create a campus I wouldn't say culture because the culture is more historical, a climate where they feel connected and feel like they have a sense of belonging. And so I wanna close with this image. So when we start thinking about this, I just said something like I said really quickly, but I wanna give you a big picture of what this all means. At the end of the day, when we think about diversity, we need to recognize that it's visible and visible traits of a very heterogeneous Latinx community. When we talk about inclusion, it's the verb. If diversity is the noun, inclusion is the verb. How do we create a sense of belonging by creating a sense of I belong psychologically and I'm physically invested? And more critically, at the end of the day, equity, the belief that everyone should have fair and just inclusion and create an opportunity for everyone to participate and prosper. These three elements are the building blocks, as you see here, of what Ohio State Texas A&M University, University of Michigan, University of Arizona, every PWI that has that 595 split needs to think about. But I, I really wanna break this down even further. The fact is we must continually examine if Ohio State University's policies, programs, and practices aligns with this mission statement to best serve Latinx students. This is not something that I consider a destination this is an ongoing critical reflective process that every institution needs to consider. How are you looking at your policies, programs, and practices as it relates to your spouse's mission statement and how do that best serve Latinx students? I can go into great detail, but I'm not. I just want you to think about in tangible ways those three elements as we think about what this means and what this looks like. And so I really wanna highlight something that I think is critical for us to have a conversation after we're done. And that is, we must deconstruct the educational experiences of Latinx students at Ohio State University. Again, I know we have people from all over the state, all over the country uh, and all over the nation. And I wanna point out, put X institution. There's four things that I want you to think about as we walk away from this web, shot, uh, web webinar and really have a conversation about this. Number one, I think it's disingenuous to just talk about enrollment and to just talk about completion. There are a lot of elements that I want you to think about as we move forward. First, the transition to Ohio State. Do we understand how Latinx students experience Ohio State, especially at their initial transition into the campus? This is a critical question because what, what we're finding is that students after the first semester do not return. And I like to say, what happens in those four months, those 15 weeks that tells a student, I do not belong. We need to have a critical conversation about what is it that's happening to Latinx students. I, I did this work with a community college once and I asked them, do you know how many people left? Oh, we had about a thousand students drop out out of the 4,000. So you lost about 25%, yes. And I said, well, of those, of those thousand, how many were Latino males? and said, oh, we don't know. I said, why don't you take a look? 750 of the thousand were Latin, Latino males. So it just raises a, a, a strong question. Do we really understand the unique experience of Latinx students as they transition to Ohio State? That's number one. Number two, academic experiences. The fact of the matter is, how do we educate and assist faculty members, academic support services, to understand the unique needs of Latinx students. I say that because when we have conversation about academic experiences, we kind of focus our energy into the, uh, into the classroom and the faculty. And, and I do a whole session. I do an entire webinar on understanding uh, cultural humility for faculty in PWIs, not cultural competency, cultural humility. And I, spend the, I do a whole session on that. But the fact of the matter is we need to understand uh, Desiree, you said something very powerful that I just want to give you a shout out when you said, I started out in accounting and I went to psychology. I'm a psych major too, so I feel you, right? 
and I start out in engineering. I feel you, right? And so here's the thing. Academic support services plays an essential role in navigating the spaces that these students are trying to figure out. So it's not enough to say that the faculty need to understand this. It's the academic advisors. It's the financial aid counselors. It's every aspect of what I call touch points in addressing the academic experience of Latinx students. Next. And I'm talking really fast, so please forgive me. Campus engagement. And that's kind of an interesting conversation, but the fact of the matter is, given the pandemic on crisis, how do we create opportunities for Latinx students to still feel a sense of belonging with the campus, students, and the larger community? One of the things that you said, Dr. Aldama, Luis, you said earlier that when you went there 15 years ago, you noticed that there was a great divide in the community. If you felt that as a faculty member, imagine an 18-year-old, a 17-year-old Latinx student coming to Columbus for the first time and seeing that community, and how, does they, how do they adapt to that community? So when we have these conversations about the educational experiences, we need to have a conversation about those three things and then the last one, which is really the most important one that people use, and that's degree completion. What do we know about the degree enrollment and completion rates for Latinx students? I make this commentary because I think it's important to recognize that we use institutional data to answer this. What are the top five initially enrolled degree programs that Latinx choose? What are those top five programs? And who are the top, or what are the top five degree programs of Latinx students? And compare those two lists. In other words, that's the Desiree and Luis formula. We started out in accounting and engineering, and we both ended up in psychology. What does that say? What happened along the way? I'm, I, I was very talented in mathematics, but something happened along the way. And when we start looking at the data and start recognizing this is what they want, and this is what they end up, and take a look at that pathway, it may reveal what more I would consider a more challenging question about what we should consider when we have these conversations about educational experiences. And I want to close with this graphic as we move to the next thing. And I just want to point out, we always have conversation about degree completion, but we don't have the conversation about the first three in, 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 in relation to that. I would make the argument that if we're going to have a conversation about degree completion, if we don't have a conversation about transitions to Ohio State or any institution, we can never get to degree completion. Degree completion are the folks who made it in spite of the first three. I'll repeat. Degree completion for the students who finish are the, the students who finish in spite of the first three. Finally, when we start thinking about what this means in the pandemic, there's a digital divide. There's a digital divide for marginalized students. There's a digital divide in who do not have reliable access to the internet. Cal State, the largest public university system in the nation, which by the way, a near and dear friend, friend of mine, Dr. Joseph Castro, just got appointed for being the first Latino male in the Cal State uh, history to lead this system. It's the largest system and we have a Latino male for the first time leading that. He was just announced just two days ago. Was among the first schools to put most learning mostly online for the fall of 2020 with a massive consequences for nearly half a million students. One third, one third are their first in the family to attend and 60% are students of color. Let's not forget food insecurity housing and security, and access to reliable internet when we talk about pandemic and what this looks like and what this means. So as we navigate, I'm almost done. As we navigate, I would be remiss. I would be ashamed if I did not help you think about what we should do in addressing the things that I shared with you. You probably wanted, you really depressed me so far. So what are you gonna tell me now? I, I really wanna point out something that I think is critical for our conversation as we move forward in this in this presentation. I don't know if you noticed, my, my slides are very graphical, very um, uh, picture-centric, and, and you see this picture. It's a lighthouse, and you see, this, you see the huge waves. There are a lot of students on Ohio State's campus across the University of Arizona, across Texas A&M, across these different institutions that are trying to find their lighthouse in the tumultuous waves not only are we dealing with this as students, we're also dealing with this as practitioners and as faculty. And so I wanna point out something as we navigate this new academic year. Students, and we need to know we're not alone. 
students and we need to know that emotional support is there. Students, we and we, both all of us, we need to see that we care for each other. Students and we need to create, create creative solutions to addressing the issues that I just talked about. Students and we need, absolutely need community. And more importantly, students and us need patience and grace, what I consider in this most unprecedented time. So it's not enough just to say that we need to help Latinx students. We need to recognize that we have to look at these students holistically. We need to look at each other. The 121 Latino faculty that are on this campus need to understand that we need patience and grace with one another. And so finally, I wanna show you this picture. I think this picture is powerful because it really kind of is emblematic of what we have to deal with in our current state. And you see, this is a, this is what I consider a, a country road with uh, a, a road that curves where you don't know what's gonna happen around that. We do not know what's around the curve of our road or what's in the forest of our lives, to the right and to the left their forest, and we don't know what's gonna happen. But we must promise to travel on our road with others and seek support from others during these challenging times. There's no solution that's gonna be quick to address Latinx student success. The factor, fact of the matter is we must rely on one another and we must promise to travel on this unknown road that we really don't know. Finally, we need to have the courage to act. After it's all said and done, you say, this is a lot. This is, what are you trying to say? This is a lot. The fact of the matter is we need to focus on improving the experience of Ohio State Latinx students is the responsibility of all members, not just faculty, not just Yolanda. In fact, Yolanda and Dr. Aldama, I think you're all amazing, but it just shouldn't be you two. It just shouldn't be the ODI office, James Moore, who's a, a good friend of mine. It's not about how smart, how much resources, or even what you look like. It takes courage to act and do something to help out our students who may be drowning in silence and fear as we talk about this issue. Thank you very much. Wow, both of uh, those presentations, I have, uh, my brain is just going all over the place. Um, so many questions. I'm gonna distill it down though, just to maybe two or three, because I know we have a lot of people with questions and I wanna make sure we leave time for that. Um, you both mentioned the significance and importance of your parents. I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe starting with Desiree, was there a role model in your life uh, when you were young, uh, maybe high school, middle school, um, someone that was like, Desiree, um, you know, you can do this, um, or, or even even beyond the modeling of themselves and who they who they were in your life, like someone actually saying that to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you asked that. Um, so when I was in high school, I used to run track and field or run track. Um, and my track coach was also the math teacher. And the high school that I went to, the school that I went to was from seventh to 12th grade. And so Tim Connor, you know, we're still Facebook friends. Um, he teaches at a different high school now and, and you know, does track at the other school. But he was really... Um, kind of pivotal in helping me understand like college is a possibility. And I think, you know, in some ways when I got to high school um, and, you know, I was a pretty good student, got A's and stuff and was kind of a nerd. Um, and so it seemed like the next natural step, but it's kind of the in-between, right? And so it's the next natural step, but I don't know how to actually take that step or what are the steps between. And so he did a really good job of um, you know, providing encouragement and support. We went on, um, you know, he took us like students, juniors, um, sophomores on college trips, right? So to go visit the different campuses in New York. Um, and so doing those sorts of things, I think are, you know, super helpful in seeing like, what does a college campus even look like? Like I had no idea, um, you know, talking to college admissions officers and then thinking about like, what scholarships can I apply for? And, you know, when I think about my own work and thinking about how school psychs and school counselors can 
support that sort of thing, you know, that was not happening in my school. And so here we have my math teacher, track coach, engaging in those, um, in that sort of mentorship and guidance that wasn't being um, done from the counselor. Um, and, you know, Tim was great. Um, you know, he was a white man too. And so I, you know, I think about that too, right? Being um, Afro-Latina, being Puerto Rican and having this white man here, um, you know, encouraging me to go to college and talking about what it means to go to college. And actually his son was, ran track in college and he would come to our track practices sometimes and he would talk to the team um, about like what college is, what his experience had been and those sort of things. And so, um, you know, I would definitely say him um, even being in New York City, I don't, I can't recall having more than two black teachers um, in my high school experience. And, you know, K to six, I went to a Catholic school. And so it wasn't very diverse then either. And so, you know, I'm thankful that um, he could fill that role because my family did not go to college. And so I did not have um, you know, support in the way um, that he could provide support with his knowledge. Wow, yeah, what a story. Um, Luis. Yeah, you know, I, I want to keep it brief. Uh, I want to be mindful of the time because I know we have a limited time. And the, the only thing I want to say about this is the fact that at the end of the day, um, allies come in many different shapes and sizes. And so one of the things that I've come to realize is that there are folks who weren't Latino that um, provided me a sense of a picture of what my potential could be. And it's those things that made me realize that uh, I, I think about Ellen Levitov as my a trio advisor. Uh, she uh, said to me when I was 18 years old, I see a bright future for you. And so for me, it's a recognition that at the end of the day, we have to recognize that uh, my job isn't try to create white guilt or, or create folks who of that 95% to feel like uh, they, they're the problem. The fact is, is that uh, we can find allies and supporters and people who are from unexpected places to support you. And so mm -hmm. given that opportunity to allow folks to share with you uh, the potential that they see in you is really a powerful uh, incentive to pursue the things that you think weren't possible. And so I just really want to suggest that when we have these conversations, this isn't just to say Latino faculty and Latinx faculty are the only people that could do this. Uh, there's a, a, a multitude of folks who can engage in this work, um, both female and male, uh, to address the issues that uh, plague our students and our faculty and our staff. Let me ask one um, more question and then I wanna make sure we've got time for the audience. Um, so both of you, and if we're going to take OSU statistics, which Luis sort of broke down for us so beautifully as our kind of number here, in a way, um, you guys like have made it, right? I mean, it, and, is, and I hate that. I hate even using the term, but it's true. Um, as um, Desiree, as an Afro-Latina scholar and educator, Luis, as a Latino scholar and educator, can you talk about some of the challenges and challenges overcome even now as, you know, faculty who are, you know, we've, we've succeeded in many ways, right? Um, and maybe Luis, we can start with you and, and then uh, move to Desiree. You know, it's really interesting you say that because I'm writing an article uh, on that very topic. And some folks would say, you know, you, you're a tenured faculty member. And quite frankly, um, there's a, a colleague of mine that wrote a book about racial ba battle fatigue and things of that nature. And I, I want to say this, um, at the end of the day, we're, we all struggle. Uh, we all deal with um, things that are private battles within our own professional careers. And we, we, we put ourselves up into these spaces, uh, this webinar, uh, these spaces that uh, we have to portray or, or be this almost invincible, almost infallible uh, I, I, icon. And the reality is um, I struggle. I struggle greatly. And I struggle when um, people tell me I'm a token immigrant. Uh, I struggle with a lot of things. And I, I wanna be completely transparent 
uh, I'm, I've read a book, I'll, I'll share it to you because it's part of my library and I'm writing about this now. Uh, it's uh, The Fearless Organization, Creating Psychological Safety in the Workplace. And I would argue that um, for me at least, just because people say I've made it, I think it's um, actually not saying much because a lot of times I feel unsafe. I feel unsafe to talk about the work that I do. I feel unsafe about me a Latino, I feel unsafe about uh, a man. And I have male privilege. Uh, as someone pointed out in the q and I have male privilege. And, um, and I recognize that. Uh, but that does not negate the fact that people have continue to question my identity, question my credentials, and question everything about me. So I don't care. And, and as you know, uh, when you take a look at the media, um, there are people who are questioned who are superstars and are pulled over for driving while black or driving while person of color. And so I don't think even though I've made it, I ever have that sense of accomplishment that I've made it because I always have a sense of unease. And as the book says, a sense of not having psychological safety. Desiree. Yeah, really to echo that point that there's a constant feeling of being unsafe, right? Especially in the academy because the academy wasn't built for us, right? And so walking into a classroom, right? Students have perceptions about who I am, um, you know, how smart I am, how accomplished, how I got there. Um, and I, you know, I've had a lot of negative experiences where students, you know, particularly because, um, you know, my work and my teaching relate to issues of race, social justice, um, inequities in the education system, um, where students are not trying to hear that. <laughs> I mean, it's the bottom line, like, you know, it's, it's not their experience. And so, um, you know, it's certainly not all my students, of course, but I think it has increased since um, 2016, right? And so I came to the U of A in 2016, um, Trump went into office, and I had a really hard um, first year and a half there. And I was not tenured either. And I'm a young woman and, you know, young black Latina woman. And so you have all these kind of, um, you know, just all these different issues right at play um, that make you feel safe. And then you don't have support either, right? Like for me in one of the experiences that I had, um, was someone saying like, well, what are you doing to make students feel uncomfortable in class? I'm just walking into the classroom, right? Like I don't even have to open my mouth and students feel uncomfortable, right? And so there's this lack of understanding too among administration. And when we think about faculty of color leaving institutions, a lot, a lot of that um, plays out when they're not supported, right? And so when I think about, um, you know, why I stay, um, I have amazing students, right? A lot of them are on here um, texting me and uh, you know, all that stuff um, who really keep me motivated and driven to do this work and who I see so much potential and they're the future um, of this field. And I've also had strong mentors, again, Dr. Miranda, Dr. Radliff, um, Dr. Moore, of course. And so that's really, you know, made me feel more safe. Um, but I think like Luis said, there is going to be there. I think there always will be a feeling of, um, you know, a lack of safety and being your authentic self. Thank you, Desiree. Yeah, really powerful. This relates to one of the questions that has come in for you uh, both. Um, that says, what strategies do you suggest to challenge the 95% to participate in the work of creating equitable, inclusive pathways for our students, faculty, and staff. And I know, Luis, you mentioned cultural humility. Um, Desiree, how would you answer that question? Um, strategies. <sighs> Lord, I feel like, you know, every time I step into the classroom and now, you know, Zoom, right? Um, virtually, have, continuing to have these conversations. And so early in the presentation, so school psychology, you know, we have APA standards, we have another national association that essentially prescribes to a specific, you know, particular extent, 
um, our curriculum, right? And so there's kind of little wiggle room. And but thinking about, you know, the classes that we teach, again, like this separate versus in, you know, integrated model, um, not just talking, I teach the diversity class, not just talking about these issues in one class, but it has to be in all of our classes. And so this semester I'm teaching consultation and we're talking about school culture and school climate, right? And the differential experiences that students have that is associated with their race, with their language, with their immigration status, um, you know, all their different identities, right? And so one, just making students aware because a lot of the students that we get, again, education and school psychology are primarily white. And so students are coming from backgrounds where, you know, the 95%, right? They've had limited exposure to other groups and other populations. And so for me, like the first step is even just making students aware that like the school to prison pipeline is real. Um, and so, you know, so that's really kind of the first thing. And then thinking about like, well, what are you going to do now that you are aware, right? When you're in a meeting with teachers and they're telling you, oh, you know, those parents don't value education, they never come to meetings, how are you going to disrupt that, right? How do we advocate um, when those parents are not in the room? And we know that that may not actually be true. And if it is true, you still can't do anything about it. So let, we have to focus on what we can actually control. And so, you know, I think it's not easy, of course, and it's emotionally taxing sometimes for me, but I, you know, I think it's, it's part of my, my job and my obligation to make sure, um, you know, this 95% are, you know, are doing what they need to do. Luis, I want to take a question that has come in. I think that's really interesting and, and maybe reframe it a little bit, um, given your concept of cultural humility, but as Latino uh, men in the academy, um, as you already pointed out, and as this person is in their questions uh, very directly pointing out, there is already a certain kind of privilege. Um, how, how do we bring cultural humility as a practice into the space of higher education and education itself to empower our um, Latina, Afro-Latina colleagues? Right. You know, that, that that's a very powerful question, and I, I spend a lot of time talking about gender differences, particularly when we start thinking about what does it mean to uh, address the notion of equity, right? And so uh, I, Dr. Vega and I, like I said, hadn't met up to this point. And um, my initial comment about uh, the serendipity of our complimentary um, presentations was really serendipitous. And what it just highlights is the fact that when we think about culture humility, it really centers around this idea that at the end of the day, we have to recognize our implicit bias. And I talk about this idea that we need to create a pathway from cultural awareness. And what does that look like? And understanding your privilege that comes with your, with your awareness of who you are. And, your, and there are a lot of folks in this session that have privilege. Uh, and we have privilege because we have internet access and are participating in this. We have privilege because we don't have to worry about having to get off here and go work somewhere because we have the time to take away to do this. So the recognition of coach humility is the recognition that you have privilege. And once you have that, the real the next step of that, and, and Dr. Vega, you can chime in here, is this idea that just because you have privilege doesn't mean that you are the center of that world or the center of that identity that you have to recognize your perspective isn't the end all be all. So there's some humility in, 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 in putting that into context of recognizing, yes, I am a male, yes, I am uh, a Latin male, and, and quite frankly, yes, I have privilege. And, and we talked about that in great uh, detail in the AHI uh, conference. It just highlights this idea that at the end, it's, it's recognizing that you're not gonna be perfect. And you're not, I, I, I say this, and Dr. Vega uh, probably has to do this with a lot, just like I do, a lot of times people don't really care what you know. They really don't. People want to know if you care about them. And at the end, cultural humility is about recognizing that you have privilege and that you're different. But at the end, can I build trust or rapport so that you know that I care about you? I don't know Dr. Vega. I know she's from New York. I know that uh, from her story. But 
I care and respect her for who she is. And at the end, that's, that's what matters. And so there are going to be times where there are going to be things that are misconstrued or misunderstood. And I accept that. But the fact is with humility is a recognition to say, you know what, Nyakupa, you're right. So what can I learn from this in order to improve the relationships that we have, particularly when we talk about spaces that are quite complex now more than ever. So I, I just want to share that. Another question uh, that came in, I think uh, um, really relevant um, and really could be important for us to discuss right now in that the pandemic has intensified what we have and our communities have been experiencing now forever. Right. It's intensified issues of socioeconomic divide, racism, systemic racism, uh, xenophobia, um, homophobia, all of these things. And um, the question is really, you know, with the digital divide that exists, how can we continue to encourage students to get involved? And I'm taking that question to think about how it, that is tough. I mean, if our students aren't, are having difficulty even getting into the virtual spaces for getting assignments done, how are, how are we going to, you know, this in this moment, this intensified moment, think that the digital space will somehow encourage them to get involved in the campus, especially Latinx students? Um, Desiree, maybe we can start with you. <laughs> Thanks. I was trying to think of a, a really good answer, and I'm not sure I have one. Um, I definitely acknowledge that, you know, it is challenging, um, you know, limited internet access, lack of internet access, poor internet service. Um, like here, we're primarily online right now, and I think OSU might have some in-person classes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when I think about OSB or um, here at U of A, because we're not in person, I know that that does create um, some challenges, but I also know that we have um, some really amazing staff in the centers on our campus. And so we have the Guerrero Student Center, um, you know, geared toward Latinx students, our African-American Student Center, the Thrive Center that I mentioned earlier, um, our Immigrant Student Resource Center. Um, and those staff are really working really hard, you know, they're working really hard to create different types of spaces and different types of opportunities to, um, you know, one, support any sort of academic, um, you know, issues students may be having, but also having things like healing spaces, especially given what's going on. Um, and so many students' families are affected by COVID and um, racism and discrimination and all the police brutality. And so having different spaces, I think, can help. But we know that that is still not going to reach students that maybe don't have access um, to internet at all, right? And I think that's when the institution really needs to step in and, you know, find some resources. Like some things they were doing at UOA that I don't really... Um, I have some mixed feelings about is just having some areas where there is Wi-Fi and that students can like drive up um, and be in kind of these hot spots. But again, that that does present some challenges of you know having a car because um, it's hot as hell out here still. <laughs> We're still in the hundreds. Um, having a laptop, right? I mean, I didn't have a computer when I was a student. Um, you know, just a lot of different issues. I don't know if there's like a perfect solution, but I know that, you know, folks like you all, especially with laser and um, ODI are taking steps. And, um, you know, I, I think there's certainly room for improvement. Luis, would you like to say a word? And then I want to um, end our session taking us back to that moment that was so important and that is so important. And you have Brianna Taylor and the moment of taking pause to really uh, recognize this human being who was taken from the world way too soon. But Luis, would you, would you like to say a few words and then uh, maybe we yeah. can talk finally about that? You know, um, I, I, I make the argument that uh, we were in education and I grew up and I'll age myself. The internet didn't exist when I went to college. 
the internet didn't exist. I, I didn't have an email until I went to grad school, right? And so it just reminds me that, um, the, uh, here, here's the way I, I, I like to uh, answer that question. Too often we ask Latinx students and marginalized groups to become more college ready. When in reality, institutions need to be more Latinx student ready. And so what that puts the onus on is not for the students to become magical and creative and, and resilient and, and resourceful. It requires the institution has far deeper resources in order to address the issues that are plaguing access to these courses. So what does that mean and what does that suggest? Well, that means that how are we going to navigate low tech solutions to high tech problems? What does that look like in terms of creating phone calls? What does that look like in creating snail mail? What does that look like in creating opportunities for, for faculty to do some asynchronous mini lectures and dropping them into, uh, into files where a Dropbox and a student can log in, get it and then get out and, and not have to be in a synchronous manner. The fact of the matter is that we, we have to be more creative. And that's what I said in the, at the end of my presentation. In these uncertain times, we need to be creative in developing low technology uh, solutions to really complex situations. This is real. And so the fact is, is that we need to be mindful that the students that we have in our classroom, uh, I was teaching online this summer and I had a student doing exactly that, going to coffee shop to coffee shop to get a good internet connection. And I recorded all of my lectures and, and sent it to them as a link and they could download it and listen to it. Those are the types of things that we have to be creative. And not to mention that, what about the cost of books? Uh, I, that, that's, that's absurd. And so I, I make a point for any of my classes, you're not to spend more than $100 on books, no more than 100. There are some books that cost three and $400 in statistics, and, and that's absurd. So I just think it's important for us to be mindful that the students that we serve, it's not for them to adjust and adapt to what they need to do to succeed. We need to adjust and adapt to help them succeed, which is a far greater responsibility on our behalf as an institution, not just as a Latinx faculty, but as an institution to address those needs. We're almost out of time here. Just a final word maybe from Dr. Vega and Dr. Ponjuan that take us into the space of Black Lives Matters. I hate to just give it a kind of a final word here, but I do wanna give it our final word. Um, and, you know, Breonna Taylor and all of the brown and black peoples in this country that face the minute they wake up to the minute they go to sleep, our families, our tios and tias, our brothers and sisters, surveillance, surveillance that ends up um, closing, shutting doors in, in the best of situations and in most and the worst of situations, actual murder. Um, racial bias training and an, an executive order um, right now. What, what would be some final words from you on this very, very important topic? Um, Dr. Vega? Yeah, I think it, you know, there's a lot of emotion around that and it can be easy to, you know, just feel hopeless, right? I know that I experienced that at times where I'm like, oh, like things are not going to get better. Um, but I think like continuing to agitate and push, um, like Trump doesn't even know what CRT is, right? Like, you know, there's, there's just so many issues. I feel like that could be a whole webinar in and of itself. But I think like having radical hope that, you know, all the activism and advocacy that we see happening um, in, the, you know, in this day and age is, is very inspiring, right? Um, this wasn't happening to the same extent a few, just even a few years ago. Um, and so it has pushed us, you know, as uh, black and brown communities to um, continue to advocate and, um, you know, push back against this, you know, hateful rhetoric, like, just, you know, it's, it's a lot, you know, I'm, I'm literally struggling for words, but, um, you know, continuing to, to push and, yeah. 
I I I want to I want to echo everything that Dr. Vega said a moment ago, and uh, I I don't want to intellectualize this any more than I have to because at the end of the day. Uh, I'm a black man. Uh, no one knows I'm Latino. And uh, when I first started here at a and uh, I had to buy a, a new bed and since said, are you the new football coach? And so no one imagines me ever being a, a tenured faculty member. But I want to take it even more real with this pandemic and dealing with um, this issue of Black Lives Matter. Uh, we all were sequestered into our homes at the beginning of March. Uh, I thought it was a good idea to make an apple pie every day for five days and eat them. And so I gained about 20 pounds, right? And so in May, I said, you know, this is crazy. I can't eat like that. I need to start working out. And I started running in my neighborhood. That's the time when Amari Arbery uh, got shot and killed in, in broad daylight. And I live in Texas. Uh, we just had a Trump rally in my town. And I had the biggest epiphany moment of my life as a scholar who has White House clearance and everything that comes with it. No one knows who the hell I am on this in, in this town. They just know I'm, I'm a pretty big guy. I'm six foot over 200 pounds. I'm a pretty big guy, pretty menacing looking guy. And if I was running in my neighborhood, which I was, and there are new homes being built in my all white neighborhood, there's someone that could call and within and within 15 seconds, I could have three cop cars literally surround me and kill me. At that point, Dr. Aldama, I stopped running. I have, been, I have been a prisoner in my own home out of fear that I can't even leave my own house to walk, go for a walk since May, out of sheer fear. And that is something that Dr. Vega just mentions that we live on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's a, it's a constant reminder that we take a lot of things for granted and when we don't have, as Peggy McIntosh talks about, this notions of backpack of privileges. And so it, it, is, it is a scary time. And, and I think the challenge of all this, the Breonna Taylor and the everything that is associated with that, it just underscores that there's a lot of hatred that has been willfully and brazenly put out, out on front and center and allowed folks to do the things that uh, this current climate has permitted. And so it doesn't suggest that we put our heads in the sand and hide. It just means that we have to be really mindful that we're dealing in a very difficult time and we have to be vigilant and resilient in addressing these issues because quite frankly, Dr. Vega and myself are, have privilege of being scholars, right? But uh, there are a lot of folks that uh, in front of my house today, uh, they were uh, putting in a new road. A, a lot of Mexicanos were there, right? And they, I walk outside and I start talking to them in Spanish. I said, so what do you do? How do you know Spanish and what do you do here? And that's your house? And so it's just a, a constant reminder that uh, we are under the microscope intensely all the time. And it's exhausting. I, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm scared and I'm exhausted. I hate to leave it on this note, but it is an important note to leave it on because it is the reality that we are living and we need to be mindful and um, eyes wide open, uh, working and working even harder. Um, Dr. Vega, Dr. Luis Ponjuan, uh, thank you. This has been absolutely amazing. Thank you for gifting us your time, your experiences, your knowledge, and finally your your will and your activism and the you know the the road that we don't see ahead you're helping us see that so thank you so much my pleasure to honor thank you and, and thank, thank you, you so thank you frederick Galdama, and um to all of our guests we appreciate your being here and i invite you to visit the odi website to look up uh the next part of our series which will be on october 7th Thank you both. Thank you all. Have a Thank good afternoon. You. Thank you. Great. All right.